So hello, good evening and welcome. I'm Neil Johnson, Chair of the AES Cambridge Regional Group and host for tonight's Audio Engineering Society UK section webinar. For people with hearing aids, the cocktail party problem is very real. How do you pick out one conversation in a very noisy environment? In tonight's talk, Dr. Tobias Goering from Cambridge University will show us how machine learning can help tune out the noise and focus on the signals you want to hear. Dr. Goering is a senior research associate at the MRC Cognition and Brain Sciences Unit here in Cambridge, where he conducts research to improve the perception of sound by those with hearing aids and cochlear implants. Originally from Germany, where he worked in automotive R&D, Tobias moved into medical research in 2013, earning his PhD at Southampton and postdocs at Cambridge and Macquarie University in Australia. Following the talk, there will be a Zoom meeting room where Tobias will be available to take questions from the audience. So without further ado, it is my pleasure to welcome Tobias to the stage. Yeah, thank you, Neil. Welcome everybody from my side. It's a great pleasure to be talking to you today. I also, as Neil said, have a kind of audio engineering background and moved then into medical hearing research. But it's great to be talking to you today and I look forward to receiving some feedback and ideas maybe and to discuss all this a bit later. So I will just share my screen here. All right, I hope that is fine now. Yeah, so I will be talking today about um, improving speech and noise perception with auditory inspired machine learning. And I will do that by giving you an uh, introduction into the problem, into the goal that we have, um, give a bit of background information, then tell you about the general approach that is used here when applying machine learning to this problem of speech and noise perception. And then I will give you a specific example because I have applied this to cochlear implants. And then I will discuss a bit and talk about future venues and opportunities and challenges. So just to introduce here the setting, um, hearing loss is a very important problem worldwide. It has a huge impact because it affects many, many people. 1.5 billion people worldwide live with some sort of hearing loss. Hearing loss is usually measured by an audiogram and then categorized into different categories. So you have at the top here, normal hearing, and then towards the bottom, more and more severe types of hearing loss. And then, for example, you have a mild to moderate hearing loss up to, let's say it's given you a 65 dB hearing level, then you can use hearing aids to help people hear better again, but for more severe or even profound hearing loss, you, these hearing aids do not provide enough amplification and so you have the option to use cochlear implants. Um, a hearing aid most people will be familiar with, it's not a mere amplifier that you wear on your ear, it's nowadays a rather complicated uh, digital signal processor or a processing device that you wear on your ear and you have different types of hearing aids, for example, behind the ear or in the ear canal or now we see more and more of these. I just put the airport here as a symbol, but more and more hearable call devices or earbuds, etc, which also have some hearing aid functionality maybe and they are coming more and more of these and the hearing aid um, contains a lot of digital signal processing functions <clears throat> from you know, the fitting function, which aligns the amplification to the hearing loss, to noise reduction, feedback compression, uh, feedback cancellation, et cetera. And more now, they have Bluetooth streaming. Um, they, have, they can be controlled with apps on the smartphone. So they have some connectivity features, et cetera. So they're rather complex devices these days. And the big difference here to the hearing aid is with a cochlear implant now, which has an outer part, an external part that is looking more or less like a hearing aid, it has a microphone, but then it transmits the sound information via a magnetic transmitter here to an internal part that is surgically implanted. So it has this receiver coil here and then an electrode array, a tiny electrode array that is surgically implanted inside the cochlea of the listener. And 
that electrode array is then used to provide electrical stimulation. So you have at the input acoustic waves picked up with a microphone. These are processed in several stages, firstly through a filter bank, then the envelopes are extracted, and these are then used to modulate um, electric pulse trains. So you see the amplitude of these little pulses corresponds more or less to the envelope in each frequency channel. And then for each frequency channel, you basically have a little electrode contact here, which goes then along this electrode array that is inserted inside the cochlear. And so at the tip here, you have the low frequencies at the apical end of the cochlear stimulated. And at the beginning, you have the, the basal end, so the high frequencies stimulated. So all with an electrical signal now. Um, however, even with hearing devices, there is limited resolution. So when you have a hearing loss that um, leads to, for example, wider auditory filters, as shown here on the left, you have normal hearing filter bandwidth of the uh, auditory filter bandwidth. And on the right, you have a hearing impaired ear. Um, so that reduces basically the spectral information that you can receive or the temporal fine structure of the sound that you can hear, etc. And for a cochlear implant, there is a big issue related to the type of stimulation, as I said. So it's an electrical signal. It's a current that is applied inside the cochlear, which has a conductive fluid. So when you stimulate on one electrode contact here, the current does not only selectively flow towards those auditory nerve fibers that you want to excite to stimulate that sound, but it goes more or less in any direction. And so if you have now several channels active, which are somewhat interleaved time, time wise, but still uh, stimulated very quickly after one another, you will have channel interaction, it's called. So we have an overlap in stimulation and excitation here. And that again leads to reduced spectrotemporal resolution and um, yeah, makes, makes a sound, uh, degrades the sound quality that you can hear with a cochlear implant, basically. Another issue here is that always the auditory nerve may be not working as well anymore as it used to be because of long-term deprivation of input sound. So also the receptor, the receiver here, the auditory nerve may be degenerated and not receive the stimulation as well as intended. And so these limitations and resolution then impact speech perception or especially speech and noise perception for, for people using hearing aids. So here, for example, you always find that when you test people with normal hearing, um, people with a hearing loss will struggle more in noise, they will need a higher signal to noise ratio, and usually there's also a correlation with the amount of hearing loss. So the higher the degree of hearing loss, there's more problems or higher SNR needed to understand speech. And with cochlear implants, it's even more so. So there's, as you can see here on the top, this is kind of the cochlear implant listeners. And at the, the full line here, the black line is uh, the normal hearing listeners. And there is a difference depending now on different background noises, but up to more than 20 dB in signal to noise ratio in some cases. So it's really a very large difference in speech and noise perception. So this is just showing this general problem we have with normal hearing. Um, speech recognition function that is even pretty good in negative signal to noise ratios where the background noise could can even be louder in terms of energy than the speech signal. But when you have a hearing loss and then using a hearing aid even, you may need a higher signal to noise ratio. So you need the speech to be roughly maybe similarly in level to the background noise. And with a cochlear implant, this even more so you need a a positive signal to noise ratio. So the speech must be much louder than the background noise in order to be perceived correctly. And so our goal is basically here to close this gap and to move these over here into the uh, more normal hearing function. So how can we do that? So we know that hearing devices can provide really good speech understanding in quiet environments. When there are no background sounds, no background noise, no reverberation, then they're working really quite well. So um, you could now say, okay, let's just improve these hearing devices more and compensate for the hearing loss and solve the problem that way. But that is obviously very difficult and it gets there step by step or it will take a long time, I think, to achieve this. And the second option now is because, as I said, when we have a really good 
uh, speech perception quiet in rough environments if we can succeed in cleaning up the speech before we presenting that with the hearing device then that would ob obviously also lead to listening benefits for these people and you can do that by a directional approach so this is the first main technique that is used you use multiple microphones and then shape the directionality of your uh, hearing aid or your cochlear implant, for example, only to the frontal direction. And so you cut out all the noise that is from the back and from the sides. And the second main method is what I will talk about mostly is a noise reduction filter, where even when you have just a single microphone or one signal after the directional filter, then to, to decide what is the signal of interest, the speech signal, and what is the background sound, and basically filter out get rid of these, uh, clean up the speech and noise signal to end up with some recovered speech or enhanced speech, I would call it. So traditionally, this has been achieved by using so-called speech enhancement techniques. There's a wonderful book here from Philippos Loisou, Loisou um, called Speech Enhancement, if you're interested in this, and also in newer techniques. And what, what has been done is usually you try to estimate the noise spectrum, so the background noise spectrum, based on some statistical assumptions here. And then you use that spectrum versus the, oh, sorry, versus the overall signal to estimate a signal to noise ratio in each frequency channel. And then you use some sort of Wiener filter or spectral subtraction algorithm to filter that noisy speech. And that has uh, led to success for listening efforts or listening comfort. So it may be sounding a bit better and people prefer it, but only very small actual intelligibility improvements, improvements. And these occur only in stationary noise. So when, when you have a non-stationary noise or like a speech like babble noise, for example, with lots of talkers chatting in the background, like in a restaurant, then these traditional algorithms do not provide any intelligibility benefit really. So this is really what we want to get at here. And so as I said, you can now use multi-microphone or single microphone techniques. And for here, for is shown for hearing impaired listeners using hearing aids now. Um, you can see there's one big outlier here, and this is a single channel noise reduction. So all the other techniques are directional filters. They just filter out noise from the back and from the side, for example, and focus on the front. They provide really good benefits if the speech is in the front and the noise is from the side or the back. And the same occurs with the CI listeners. That really with these directional filters, you can really improve listening, but with a single channel, if these background noises are more realistic now, babble noise, different people chatting, then they do not provide any benefits. And for a directional filter now, as I said, it, it really relies on this uh, separation of the speech and the background noise. So in the co-located case, when the speech is in front at zero degrees and the noise is in front, then also you do not have, as we would expect, any benefit here in listening because all the noise and all the speech comes through and nothing is filtered out. So you don't have any listening benefit really for that situation. So again, this is more or less the situation that we look at here with these algorithms that I will show you now. So we will use, or we have been, or I have been using machine learning techniques, which is just a subfield of so-called artificial intelligence, a fancy name for this. There's a deep learning field, which is a very big hype now. But the main key thing I wanna make here, the main point is that it's a really powerful technique to detect patterns in data, right? So if you have a lot of data, then these techniques really provide some benefits now. And so when you have here a noisy speech signal, then we want to apply now a machine learning algorithm that can detect the underlying pattern of speech in this noisy background and basically uh, filter that out or yeah, improve that signal for us. So it's really taking a new technique or not as new, but a recent technique and apply it to an old problem here. How do we do that? So this is often done, and I have used this concept of the time frequency mask. So it's a pretty simple concept. You have speech here, a speech signal. A plea for funds seems to come again. 
yeah, just a sentence. Then you have a background noise signal. Yeah, I cannot play this now, but you can imagine if you add the two together, you obtain some noisy speech, we call it, just a mix of the two. And now if you know basically the underlying speech signal here and the underlying noise signal, you can calculate this called so-called Wiener function or the ID ratio mask, where you see here across time and frequency, the light areas are where there's a lot of speech energy and not so much noise energy, where the SNR is basically high. And in the dark areas, it's, it's a reverse where, where there's not much speech energy at all, but there's mostly noise. So if you take this filter, this mask, and you multiply point-wise with this noisy speech here, then you obtain this enhanced speech. A plea for burdens seems to come again which gives you a really good intelligibility back. It cuts out all the noise between in the speech gaps, but you hear a bit of roughness on the speech because the phase is distorted due to the additive noise here that is still on there. The problem now is we do not have access to the speech and the noise separately, so we need to estimate this function now. And this is where the machine learning kicks in now. So firstly, we extract features so we have the input speech the noisy speech and we then for for short time chunks here we extract some sort of features this could be just a spectrogram for example a fourier transform or now auditory inspired an auditory filter bank for example and you do that then uh, sequentially so for many different time steps just with a very short overlap we'll talk about that later you extract these vectors or these spectra and for example, it has been shown now that when you use a gamma tone filter bank, which is basically a, a rough or a simplistic simulation of the basilar membrane in the cochlear, and it simulates the same frequency allocation, et cetera, and frequency sensitivity as the human auditory system, then these filters over or outperformed more traditional, just for example, using a, just a standard FFT or so. And also we used in a study auditory inspired features where we used an auditory model based on the gamaton filter bank again, and that also performed better than more traditional features without this auditory inspired uh, allocation. So basically what we always use is some sort of gamaton filter bank here, and that is our auditory inspired component now. Um, and then we extract different features, we concatenate them, and you may also add previous frames just to get, give some temporal context because we can't really extract future time information. We can only extract previous frames or previous information in the, from the past, basically. So now this is given, these features are given as an input vector com concatenated to a deep neural network here. That's what I used. So it has an input layer, a multi-layer structure with several hidden layers now with a number of hidden units using a nonlinear activation function. And at the output, you always provide this time frequency mask or the noise reduction filter. So basically for every vector at the input here, for every input feature vector, you have a vector at the output describing the ideal mask that is needed to obtain the noise reduction or to perform the noise reduction. And so again, you do that and feed through the network step-by-step step these vectors. And for each vector, you calculate um, an error. I will show you that in a bit. So here we use supervised training now. So we make a lot of audio data. We, we just take different speech stimuli, speech sentences, speech databases, and mix these with noise recordings at different SNRs. We then extract these feature vectors, as I said, feed them to the neural network. That gives us an estimate of the mask that is then compared to the ideal mask. An error is calculated. This is, for example, just a mean squared error between these two for each vector. And then the gradient is calculated and back propagation is used to fine tune this deep neural network here. And that is done over and over. And after you know many iterations, then the network starts to learn how to estimate this function. But it sounds easy and it's it, the principle is easy, but there's a lot of choices. There are a lot of choices that you have to make here. For example, you have to choose your, your data for the training. You have to choose the features. 
There, there are many different, you can use many different network architectures now from feed forward recurrent convolutional deep neural networks or mixture of these and the optimization process. So what kind of training algorithm, what is the target function, etc. So there are many, many choices and they are also interacting. So basically endless choices that you can make here. And that has led to uh, quite a few studies over the years. So it started out with you know, small training data, then it increased. Now it's pretty large training, data. not huge, but several hours at least of training data. The architectures also changed from Gaussian mixture models to deep neural networks using feed forward layers to these dropout techniques and then now to recurrent neural networks, convolutional neural networks, and now to many more different complex structures and the same for the target, et cetera. So for, for each of these domains, there has been a lot of progress made over the years. And so we are now ending up in a system with systems that are, that are pretty strong and are pretty performing pretty well in many different tasks. But the journey is not finished yet. So once you have then trained this system here, you can take these two blocks, the feature extraction and the neural network and put that into your DSP, as I said, in the hearing aid or in the cochlear implant in theory, and then perform the denoising in that system, given that it has the computational power and the memory power, et cetera, the battery power to, to perform these calculations actually. And that brings me to this point of the requirements. So you have technical requirements, as you can imagine. There's mainly the computational power that is increasing and increasing, as we know. You can, for example, shift some of the processing eventually to a smartphone, which are becoming more and more powerful now. But also the devices itself are getting more and more efficient and powerful. And so um, the same happens with the memory and the battery limitations, which are you know, solving, let's say, itself by time, maybe. But the one key requirement is this kind of causal processing here. You need to provide real-time information based more or less real-time. So that is given by the tolerable delay. So if you play back the sound to the listener, you don't want to delay it by more than 20 to 30 milliseconds. Otherwise, you'd um, distort the audiovisual synchronicity or synchrony of the signal, or you may introduce echoes for hearing aid listeners, and this is all not tolerable for people that want to just hear better. It would make them, you know, hear worse, basically. So another point is perceptual speech quality, environmental awareness, and so on. And you want to make sure that your algorithm works in realistic environments. So there is quite a few of requirements here in terms of technical and perceptual domains for these algorithms. And I want to highlight just maybe two groups here, Philip Loiseau's group at UT Dallas and Dylan Wang's group at Ohio State, which have provided lots of the groundwork for these ideas that I'm presenting here. So I want to highlight them. And now I want to give you an example from my own research, which is uh, on cochlear implants. And it's from 2019. So it's already two years old before COVID happened. So my first study actually that I performed during my PhD, I used a deep neural network to do exactly what I described to try to denoise speech. And what we found, what I found is that it worked really well for the stationary noise. You can see here the improvements. They are highly significant. There were clear improvements for a steady noise. For an ECRA, this is a competing talker noise. So it's just one competing talker in the background, which is uh, having a kind of noisy <laughs> character. So it's not really the voice, it's just a noisy um, competing talker. It worked even better, but for a bubble noise now, these are 20 different talkers mixed together in the background, like in a restaurant, for example, then the system did not provide significant improvements when it was trained on many different speakers or talkers. So when it was not trained on a specific speaker of interest where we found improvements. So this is really what I wanted to get at in this study that I will show you now. So here we use an algorithm based on, so it starts at the bottom here, based on a recurrent neural network. So we firstly extract these gamma tone filter bank features, as I described earlier, for five timeframes. Then we feed them, concatenate them, and feed them to 
an LSTM uh, network. It's a recurrent neural network with 128 hidden units and two hidden layers just. So it's not huge. So our goal is always to make these as efficient as possible so that you could, in theory, maybe implement them in a hearing device, at least in a couple of years, maybe. And then at the output, we estimate this ratio mask, basically what exactly what I described to you, this uh, noise reduction function. And then we apply that to the to the noisy speech and we resynthesize the sound and present that to the listeners. So for the training data, we use now um, nine hours of speech. So there's a mixture of 80 different talkers. And then they, these recordings in total 8,000 sentences were either mixed with 25 different bubble noises. So these are realistic recordings from restaurants or cafeterias, etc or with 25 recordings from traffic noise on a street, et cetera, in a city. So we have two different systems, B and T here, which are trained either on bubble noises or on traffic noises. And then the testing data now is that there's a completely new speaker. So this hasn't been seen by the network. It hasn't been used for the training, this speaker. And unseen bubble noise, so a new, a completely new recording of bubble noise, but it's still a bubble noise, and the same here for the traffic noise. And for the training, I have to highlight we only used an SNR here of five decibel. This doesn't really make sense. It was just to see how well does it generalize then to a whole range of mixing ratios between the speech and the noise. If you were to obtain the best system possible, you would obviously also train the system on a range of signal to noise ratios. Okay, so here is some examples now for this electrical stimulation pattern I talked about. So these are the output signals of a cochlear implant for speech, for speech and noise, you can see the noise here. And then after the processing with this deep neural network, where you can see if you look in this area that the noise here is gone mostly. And at the last point is the ideal mask. So this would be the absolute perfect noise reduction because we only allow 10 dB of noise reduction. So there's still a bit of noise left here. So the DNN is doing a really good job for the easy case now when it's a high signal to noise ratio here for the speech and noise. But when I switch now to a difficult case, then there you can see there's much more noise now in the input signal because it's at a zero dB. So the background noise is as loud as the speech. Then you can see here that the DNN is slowly struggling and there's quite a bit of noise coming through the DNN noise reduction filter now. Whereas in the ideal mask, most of that noise is gone still. So now we... Um, go through a quite sophisticated evaluation procedure, which is quite important. I think when you do hearing research, you want to make sure that actually there are listening benefits now. And you cannot just assume that when you look at the cost function, for example, for your training, the mean square error, that if you have the lowest mean square error, that that will always translate into the best or into listening benefits. You don't know if that improves intelligibility or not, especially if, you, if we talk about people with a hearing loss. It's just really hard to say when they're listening through a CI if a uh, signal processing algorithm will improve things or even degrade things. So you cannot say that based on technical measures. So we use some sort of prediction algorithms. This is a kind of called STOI or NCM based on envelope-based correlations. So this is one step further than just calculating these simplistic metrics. We look now at the envelopes in the auditory domain and see how well is the um, the, the enhanced speech that was processed with a deep neural network, how well is that correlated with a clean speech without any noise? So that's better, but still not perfect. So then we go to listening tests with simulations where we use vocoder or hearing loss models and play that to normal hearing listeners in order to simulate a hearing loss or a cochlear implant. And then see, do we see benefits for this group? before we then actually do the listening test with the CI and the hearing aid users. And that is because obviously the time, the effort, the cost is just much higher for performing these experiments here with the actual listeners. So we wanna make sure and increase our chances that once we go to that point, we are pretty sure you know there is, there is something there or we are pretty confident that this algorithm works or improves things. So, for 
the prediction algorithm now, these are just the, the algorithms that try to predict speech intelligibility. And here we see, for example, interestingly, that the effect that there is an effect of the number of talkers in the background noise. So when you, for example, here have just two talkers in the background noise and a lot of noise, so they're very loud, then the system does not provide much benefit. But when there are more talkers in the background and each individual talker is a bit lower in level, then, then there is a clear benefit. And when there's a high signal to noise ratio, it doesn't really matter. It always gives some benefit, it seems. But when we compare that to the ideal mask, we see there's a lot of room for improvement still. So the DNN, this algorithm in gray, gives some benefit, it seems, but it's not there yet. There's a lot of room to, to get even better. And then we found some further things. For example, we found that this recurrent neural network gave a small benefit. Sorry for that gave a small benefit over the feed-forward neural network architecture, for example. I said we found this effect of the number of background talkers, and we found that there is a kind of complex generalization now. So if you train the system, as I described, on babble noises, and then you test it on traffic noises, which it hasn't been trained on, then it worked really well, but not the other way around. So if you train it on lots of different traffic noises and then test it on a babble noise, it didn't work at all. So you cannot really say before you test it, you know, which way does the system generalize and which doesn't. So then I want to show you the simulation results. So these are now with normal hearing listeners listening to these CI cochlear implant simulations using a vocoder. And there we found that this really improved listening for all listeners only in the, we tested only in the babble noise now. So we found significant improvements of between one and three decibel in SNR for, for these listeners, for 10 listeners. And this means basically you have, um, you can have a three dB lower signal to noise ratio to understand as much, as much speech or yeah, as to understand 50% of the speech, sorry. And so then we basically went on to do, as I said, the full experiment with the cochlear implant listeners. And we tested now in bubble noise and in traffic noise as well. We did that with 10 CI listeners. Here you can see the results, the group results, where we found that with the algorithm, as we hoped, there was a small improvement here. Um, and with the ideal mask, there was a huge improvement. So this is basically, yeah, infinite improvement, obviously, with the if you know the perfect noise reduction, then you can improve things as much as you want. Um, but if we look now at the individual results of these 10 listeners, then really it comes, to, it, it shows that what I said earlier, it's hard to predict these results. So for the bubble noise, we found that for each listener, for all listeners, here you see the change. These are improvements if they're positive. We found that there was a benefit of 3.5 or 4 dB, and every listener benefited from this noise reduction algorithm. Whereas in the traffic noise, overall, there was a 2 dB improvement, but that was not significant because three or four of the listeners actually got a bit worse with this algorithm, which wasn't really predicted by the prediction algorithms or by us. So this really shows how important it is, I think, to do these actual listening experiments. And then we also evaluated subjective ratings. So not just looking at intelligibility, but also looking at speech distortions, noise intrusiveness, and the overall quality of the signals. So asking the listener basically to rate how intrusive is the background noise for you without any processing, with the processing, and with the perfect processing. And you see here, it's basically aligned or it confirms the results with the intelligibility results. We see very strong improvements here for the bubble noise, where the people, the CI listeners said, basically it's very similar to the perfect noise reduction, but in the traffic noise, it's much less so. So these are kind of aligned or they confirm the results we found for the intelligibility. So to discuss this, I've just shown you some results, but there are more. So there's really a lot of evidence now that these machine learning techniques 
using deep neural networks or other types of neural networks can improve speech perception noise for people using hearing devices based on this supervised training scheme that I described. We also find that these algorithms improve the subjective quality ratings of listeners. And we've shown now and others and many in many several studies that these systems can generalize now across signal to noise ratios, across different talkers that were not used for the training. They were not part of the training data. It's always a trade-off though. So if you if you generalize, if you spe specialize on you know, one single SNR or one specific talker, then the system performs better for that case, obviously. So the limitations are that the system that I showed you really kind of falls apart or starts to fall apart when the signal to noise ratio is below zero dB. So when the background noise becomes much louder than the speech, then also the system will not work as well. It's all lab environment and there's no reverb in my re results that I showed you. So it's really just background noise. The advantages are that it really works well in a positive signal to noise ratio, which I think is more realistic. I don't think it just, there are studies showing that typical listening environments have signal to noise ratio starting at maybe zero dB or maybe minus two, but then typically go up to five or 10 dB. And these are exactly the situations where we see now benefits with these algorithms. They are real time feasible because they only process very short time frames at a time. So they don't introduce much delay and they are now scalable in some sense. And so we may not be able now to, to close this gap fully, but maybe there is really evidence now that shows that if you were to use such an algorithm in a hearing device, then you can improve at least somewhat these uh, speech perception results by hearing aid users and cochlear implants. If you want more information, there are obviously papers out there that describe this. So future venues that are interesting, I think, are this this topic of generalization versus specialization. So you could think of having a spouse mode where you train the system on your spouse's voice and then, or on the opposite basically, and it can perfectly um, amplify just the spouse's voice or perfectly attenuate it. And as well, similar cases apply to, for example, a restaurant mode or wherever you may be, you could basically specialize the system. It's a big advantage for the data-based systems here. Now it has been shown that when you use audiovisual integration, then that really boosts performance. But I'm a bit skeptical because maybe people do not want the camera on the hearing device, but that would really in the future be a venue where you could also improve performance very much. There are now really strong results also for speaker separation. So if you have just two talkers, one competing talker and one main talker, then there has been results have been shown now by different labs where you can even have very low signal to noise ratios and you have near perfect separation of these different speakers. So that's very promising as well. And there's more coming here. And then now what I find really interesting to think about at least is when we think about once we have the perfect noise reduction system that can really pick out a voice of interest how do you do that? So how do you decide what is the voice of interest? And when you want to change your listening attention, your auditory attention, how do you detect that? And how do you make sure that there is environmental awareness? So when you reduce all the background noise, you won't hear any alarms or people speaking to you from the other side of the room or so. So there's a lot of, I think, challenges and research needed here to get this right in the future. Because the noise reduction really only is the first step. So this is a kind of uh, chicken and egg problem, I think. So when you have, for example, somebody listening to a specific talker and then the noise reduction system really kicks in and attenuates all the other speakers in the room, you basically miss out on the other conversation. So you need a system then that is clever enough to yeah, incorporate that. And I have no, no idea yet how to do that or how we can achieve that. So, this was my talk. I would just like to use this uh, for a short, quick advertisement. So we are hiring soon for three positions and actually one position came live today. So if you're interested in these kind of ideas, topics, themes, or you know people, then please share this with them. Um, we are working in the Cambridge Hearing Group here, which is a great 
community of hearing researchers doing research on hearing aids, cochlear implants, and hearing in general. We, or I am here at the Kearing Mutering Hearing Group, also organizing a conference this year. It's a virtual conference on computational audiology. It's free, it's a one day event. So if you're interested in these kind of topics, audiology, there's a lot of machine learning involved, etc., then check out our website and you can register very soon. It's all for free and one day just. And then I would like to acknowledge my funding, which is the MRC now with a fellowship, a career development award. I've been supported by RNID or previously called Action on Hearing Loss before and by the EU, by Marie Curie Actions. And I would like to thank my collaborators. So this is not work just by me, obviously. So there has been a lot of support here by Bob Carline, Brian C.J. Moore, and especially Mahmoud Keshavarsi, my co-author, Jessica Monaghan, Federico Bolner, and Stefan Blick, and also all the members from the Cambridge Hearing Groups, where are many more that I don't mention now, but there are many more great colleagues here. And yeah, thank you for listening and for the attention. And I'm happy to take lots of questions or suggestions or so. Well, thank, thank you, Tobias. That's been a fascinating talk. Um, yes, I'm not sure the spouse um, blocking mode would, uh, would go down too well, but uh, <laughs> yes. Children. Um, <laughs> sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we have a couple of questions uh, already in the Q and A. If if anybody else has um, questions that they'd like to ask now, um, please use the Q and A button at the bottom. Just um, go through what we currently have. I've got a few questions myself. Um, so Jamie is asking, what do you mean by a complex mask? Ah, okay. Yeah. So this is. Um a mask that estimates both the amplitude and the phase of the speech. And that's why it's called complex because it's the complex uh, signal after the FFT. So which is the, you know, the imaginary and the real part of the signal. And so that's why it's a complex mask that's called. Yeah. And what I use is just the ratio mask, which is just uh, estimating the amplitude of the speech actually, and not the phase of the speech. And a uh, second question from Jamie, uh, the, the MSC, I'm guessing that's mean squared error, the L2 norm, it tends to outliers much more. Would using the L1 norm or absolute value possibly offer some improvement? Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, I have not compared these two, I think. Um, in general, I always, I mean, I had a couple of ideas, you know, also to shape the the cost function, the error function, for example, to, to focus more on speech relevant areas or frequencies. But I always found that getting back to the MSE gave the best performance, maybe because of the mathematical properties or maybe because especially it focuses on the outliers and gets rid of them more strongly. Yeah, so I, I don't have a good answer. I, it, it would be worth checking, I think, trying different cost functions more. Yes. Great. A uh, question from Steve, Steve Armstrong, um, says, great talk. I, I think everybody is in agreement with that. Um, why constrain noise reduction to 10 dB? Um, 10 dB in the... Ah, okay. I get it. Um, yeah. yeah, so this is basically because I am intending to keep some environmental awareness. So maybe it has two reasons. So I think in a in hearing aids, for example, you also limit noise reduction somewhat because you, maybe people are not trusting the system as much. So you're also reducing the kind of impact it can have. So if it goes really wrong, your noise reduction, then it can only do that much harm, let's say, if it's just reduced or limited to 10 dB. I think also 10 dB is already giving you quite a large benefit, as you've seen in the ideal ratio mask cases, when you have the perfect noise reduction and you just allow 10 dB, you get basically down to minus 10 dB single to noise ratio. So it's it's a huge improvement still that you get with 10 dB. If we were to get that improvement, then everybody would be happy. You could make a patent, patent and uh, be very rich. <laughs> so, yeah. Right. Uh, Jose is asking, uh, in practical terms, what are the following steps to bring these algorithms to real products and thus final users? Yeah, very good question. I mean, I am not an expert on this. You would have to ask the actual companies, but I think the next 
yeah, the, the important steps is really to, to squeeze these systems into the DSP, into the memory requirements that you have, into the computational um, power that is available. You've got to make sure it works, you know, in many different situations for, for, for what you think the people will be using it. So there are these listening tests and confirmation studies that you have to run, validation studies, I think. And then the, on the technical side, I, I said, you have to make sure the DSP that you're using on your device is able to perform these algorithms. And then I think there is not much more to do. So the, the, the principal processing underlying it, it's real-time feasible, you know, it's all there, the algorithms. There's not so much more if you, I think, that I can think of. It needs to be done. Okay, question from Harish. You mentioned the benchmarks, uh, the bench metrics such as STOI did not correlate with the target group for hearing aid and cochlear implants. Was that only observed for traffic noise? Um, so, so I have to um, pull back a bit. It's they are correlating, so they are giving some information. They are just not perfect. So it's it's really getting more limited when you talk about cochlear implant listeners, but we always see a lot of variability in listening outcomes with cochlear implant listeners anyway. And these persist even after noise reduction, et cetera. They are basically happen all the time. So it's really kind of particular case with the cochlear implant listeners. So in general, these algorithms are very useful tools. They give you some idea, but they don't give you this individual variability. So you may still have one or two listeners you know, who, who then do not benefit. And then it's really hard to say why, why do they not? And that was the case in the traffic noise, right? Where some listeners didn't get better, um, but the STOI and the other algorithms all said basically, yeah, it should get better. But yeah, that's a typical finding in the cochlear implant literature. <laughs> we are fighting with, with that. Okay, uh, Steve comes back with another question. Um, would it make sense to limit the ideal mask to a 10 dB reduction? Also perhaps make a better comparison? Uh, I did that actually. So okay. sorry, this wasn't clear or I didn't say that clearly. So yes, so I did that. So all the results that you saw for the ideal mask, the ideal mask was also limited to 10 dB noise reduction, but still it gives you this beautiful you know, results, these huge improvements. Yes, yes. Okay. Um, David asks, uh, is there work in analyzing the audio waveform directly rather than the gametone feature vectors yes. to produce the audio tree masks? Yeah, exactly. That is, uh, especially during the last one or two or three years, there's this, uh, I forget the name, from Google, there's an approach. Mm -hmm. Wave net or something where they really go directly end to end on the acoustic waveform and you don't have any filter bank or so between that. So because the neural networks and the machine learning techniques are getting so powerful now and so refined, they are actually finding that sometimes this gives better results even. It's just a bit, I'm not sure, yeah, for, for a hearing aid or a clock lamp, maybe because you have the filter bank already in there, it's already in the device and and you have a bit more control so i think that's an important point because as we said we can limit the noise reduction to 10 db but if we have a system that takes a waveform and transforms it into a new waveform then we cannot really do much we don't have much control over the system or so but if you have a noise reduction filter like the masks that you showed you and you can limit that somewhat and you can only do attenuate things then you can only do that much harm and you keep some control over your noise reduction and your network. Okay. Question from David. Uh, what are the typical MIPS in your neural net implementation? Oh, something you've know. measured yet? No, I haven't measured it. Um, in MIPS, I don't know it, but um, it's... So if I remember correctly, these networks only have about... 50,000 parameters or so that I showed you. Uh, maybe the newest study is a bit more. Yeah, so in terms of MIPS, I do not know. I, yeah, this is really for important for the implementation. Yes. But, uh, I do not know, yeah. sorry. <laughs> okay, um, Bijal asks, uh, did you experiment on wind noise removal? Uh, how well do these techniques translate in helping in that scenario? 
Yeah, exactly. So, so we did actually a study on wind noise um, uh, for hearing aid users. And yeah, we did not test intelligibility objectively, but we did have ratings and we found improvements statistically significant, but they were rather small, let's say. So they were only really small uh, benefits for this. Yeah, it's quite difficult, I think, because wind noise is very fluctuating, right? It, it kicks in and then it's really strong. So it's it's quite a challenging noise for, for these systems as well. Because you okay. go basically from, sorry, but you go from, um, yeah, from plus 10 dB to minus 15 dB within, you know, a couple of milliseconds. <laughs> it's really hard. Okay, and at the moment, a Final question from uh, C it asks um, again, really interesting talk. Um, this uh, they've come across similar work in speech enhancements rather than medical fields. How does your approach differ trying to improve intelligibility rather than speech quality? Hmm. Um, yeah, they don't really. In my case, <clears throat> you know, we just use this. I just use this um, idea ratio mask as a training target, and that has been shown to improve both intelligibility and quality. And that's a target for the training. So, you know, when you achieve a good system that can estimate that, you're fine. But I agree, it's important to think about that. And now there has been new approaches that do not train, for example, just on the mean square error at the output, but they train directly on the cost function based on the STOI or the PESC algorithm, for example, or the perceptual estimation of speech quality. So you, you feed back information into the network during training, how well it improves quality aspects of speech. And that is really a venue that has been uh, pursued recently. And I think then what they found is mostly, yeah, then it really improves PESC or STOI if you train it on that. <laughs> Yeah, but then again comes the problem with the limitation of these PESC and STOI algorithms that you're never sure is it really the, the best. But yeah, it's a good approach to think about. Okay, well, I think that's all the questions we have in the Q&A. There we go. It, it is my, my pleasure to uh, thank Tobias for his talk and slideshow. It's been fascinating. I've certainly learned a lot about um, hearing and uh, how to use uh, uh, machine learning to improve um, one fifth of the human population's hearing, which is astonishing, really. Um, and yes, I think the takeaway message for me is look after your hearing, look after your ears, because um, a lot of clever people are putting a lot of work in to um, improve people's hearing. So a big thank you. A round of applause for Tobias. Um, I know we can't do it in person, but one day, hopefully, we will. Um, and as I said, um, we are now going to adjourn to an online Zoom meeting. Um, link in the chat where, um, and also in the email where we can have a more interactive um, Q&A session with Tobias. So uh, thank you all. Thank you, everyone, for attending, and see you soon. Yeah. Thank you also from my side. <laughs>